Hello everybody, I'm fashionably late. <laughs> Look how bright that is. It's garbage. I don't know why you guys keep tuning in. Ugh. I thought, let me turn the entire tank on in 10K lighting, and I thought maybe that would help, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It still looks terrible. Let me take it a step further. What if I just do it from back here? Does that help? <laughs> uh, anyway, you guys like the tank in the background. I think you're crazy. Let me see if I can bump this up slightly. There we go. All right. Hi, Gabriel. Hi, James. I just remembered someone asked me last week to quit using his whole name um, on the stream. I'm supposed to remember that one person and only use their first name. So we'll see how well that works out. I want to welcome you guys to the show. Uh, this week's topic is going to be about all the things that happened at Mac. Now, a little bit about what happened last week, about the meetup, and uh, some products I brought home, things that I learned about at the show that is still in the works. So there's a lot to cover, and uh, I'll do my best, you know, but, you know, there's going to be more information you can find on other websites as well that delve in depth to the information uh, of these various products because there's so little time. And when MACNA happened, there was this big hurricane concern. There was a lot of talk about that rather than focusing on the show. The schedules were abbreviated. There was people leaving early because they were worried they were gonna be stuck there for a week. And it kind of killed the MACNA vibe for me um, as a huge MACNA advocate. This was like my 18th or 19th one in a row. And so I was kind of, uh, you know, it bothered me because usually it always works out. I mean. Actually, I can't think of one Mac now where it didn't work out. But, you know, ultimately everyone had to decide for themselves what they could live with and how they felt safe or not. So, hi everybody. We are up to 37 people have snuck in here. All right, let's start off with something really easy and simple. Um, first of all, I want to mention that last week I flew into Orlando a little bit early and I got to finally visit Disney World for the first time. And I went to Magic Kingdom and I went to Animal Kingdom. Magic Kingdom was great. Animal Kingdom was much too hot. I actually think maybe the AC systems were down because everything was hot. Every shop was hot. Uh, every show was hot. It was hot and I was dying. And that coupled with what's going on with my spine made me a very unhappy Milev. And I was really not able to uh, enjoy myself that much that day. I mean, I was miserable and I couldn't even take, I couldn't even eat food to take a pill because I had zero appetite. So eventually, you know, I got over that. Let me move this thing over here so I can see your comments. I've put the camera over here on the side. So I'm going to keep looking off camera, and I apologize for that. But the reason for that is when I put the camera on top of this station, anytime I touch the table, it vibrates the camera. I noticed that, and I figured that's got to be really bothersome to you guys. So I, I've got you on a separate tripod that kind of puts you on the side. I need to come up with some kind of gizmo that holds it right here in the middle. That would be perfect. So... Um, so at MACNA this year, uh, it started Friday. The first thing we did is we went to the Apex Meetup, which was really cool. Um, they, a lot of times, will talk about one person's setup. So this year, Richard Ross talked about his setup that was down in his crawl space under his home. That's where everything is. I think the area is 40 inches tall or 48 inches tall. So you're doing everything you can when you work on that tank on your knees. And he actually was somewhere else, like uh, Indonesia. And so his tank sitter had to deal with some g major crisis. I mean, basically the tank was missing like 50 gallons of water and he had to find out why. So he was down there trying to figure it out. Richard was checking Apex Fusion and learning about, you know, what was happening and watching salinity change and, you know, trying to give suggestions to his tank sitter what to do. And uh, they ended up finding the problem. It turns out a bulkhead, the nut was loose. And so it was leaking around the bulkhead and down and across the, because it was a crawl space. I guess the water just kind of merges with whatever, whether that was wood or, or dirt, but it just was hard to find the source. And he had salt creep everywhere. If that was my crawl space, I'd be down there with a pressure washer blasting everything clean so it can see what's going on and maybe identify a problem, hopefully sooner, rather than trying to dig through all the crusty salt, trying to find a problem. That's just me. I recommended it to him. If he wants to listen to me, that's up to him. The, uh, after that, we had uh, four different people do a presentation. It, couldn't, it could only last five minutes. They talked about something that they DIY'd to make their tank better in relation to using the Apex. And the winner of that presentation won a Trident. 
So that was a huge prize. And uh, it was interesting that two of the four people that got up there actually took a second during their little brief talk to say, wow, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> so talking to the public, you know, I've always heard that that makes people nervous. I've never had that problem. I, I talk to everybody. I don't care if it's one person or a thousand people. I just, you know, I'm talking. But uh, yeah, they found that that was to be challenging. And uh, so one showed a special way of lighting. Um, another one, actually, I can't even remember. I'm not even gonna try off the cuff of my head. I'll try to remember it later. But uh, then at the end, uh, the entire group of people, which was probably about 400 people in the audience, would vote on the winner based on how loud you applauded. So that was a lot of fun. Um, Mark Callahan was up there and did a brief presentation as well. And then we went into Magna, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So um, the one thing that we gleaned from that meeting specifically was that they are no longer going to tell us something they're working on in advance because, as they said, it's you can't win. Because if you put it out there and say we're working on this, then everyone complains it's not ready yet. And then when it is released, they're complaining that, you know, whatever, it's there's not enough of them in stock or there is a... That, you know, oh, these are the new, the early adapters or adopters are dealing with all these issues and, you know, should have known better. It just, they said, you know what, from now on, we're just going to work on a product and we're going to push it out when it's ready and that's it. <laughs> and I can't blame them because, I mean, honestly, there was a lot of grumbling about, you know, and there's, this has been with a few products. Uh, there was, uh, other ones that came to mind was uh, a certain controller um, that has still to this day, I don't believe has become real. You know, it's just not worked, and so it's never gone to public. Uh, Mindstream was one of those things people kept asking about, and it finally released at this Machna. And at this Machna, it was only, uh, it was only, well, it was $300 off. So my Mindstream is right here. I put it right there this week. I've got some cool ideas I want to do with it, but uh, I'm not going to talk about it till I do them because I don't know if it's going to make any difference or not. But I'm hoping that I'll get something really cool out of my my theory. So we'll see about that. Um, I guess I need to do something here. Let me show you guys if I can find it. Arg. Why is it when I need it I can't find it, and when I don't need it I see it the whole time? There it is. All right, here we go, everybody. Wait for it. <laughs> Should happen any second now. We're waiting. It still hasn't worked. Oh, it was an inside joke. Anyway, it didn't work out. What the, the thing was is that I was going to hold that up and do nothing, and suddenly a super chat was going to appear from VCA. <laughs> we had prearranged that, but he must have walked away from his computer. It's OK. That was just funny. Uh, actually, the thing he gave me was like a little tiny itty bitty um, nozzle that goes on a keychain. So you know they 3D print these little tiny nozzles like I have right there in my tank. And so this one, you can have in your keychain and have it with you at all times. There it is. You're late, Anthony. You ruined my joke. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> okay, so that was just supposed to be for fun. I'm gonna stick it on the screen if I can figure out how. Uh, just because that was funny. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, we were hoping that that would time up perfectly. Like, I just hold it up and then bing. But eh. the delays of live streaming, right? All right. Um, so let's talk about some things. ICP analysis. I have done this test at least nine times um, myself. And while I was at Macna, they had a special sale, which I think was mostly to people like me that run a business, uh, where uh, you could buy a bunch and get a few extras for free to kind of you know make a little bit more profit. So I definitely bought some. <laughs> but uh, while I was there, so I've got this one. This is ICP analysis. I also did an interview with the people over at Triton. So this is their ICP test. 
And this one here measures, uh, I forget how many, but let's just pretend that's 40 little squares because I'm not gonna do math on live camera. But they came out with this new one and that's the one that caught my eye. So this one measures the nitrogen area. So it's gonna include nitrates, it's going to include alkalinity, and it's going to include dissolved organic compounds. So that was very interesting to me. <laughs> VCA, stop, you don't have to send any more money. That was a joke, stop. All right, so these kits, in case you're wondering what they run, uh, this is 49 and this one's 49. So you're looking at $100 to measure everything in your water. And uh, these are the ones that get shipped to Germany. However, um, keep your ears tuned to the web because I believe a machine has shown up in California, so you'll get your results sooner. And it stays in the US and doesn't have to go overseas and wait for the results. So these two are um, something I'm gonna try. In addition, I also got a test kit from, I didn't open this. Ah. Sorry, I should have had this ready. I had no idea this would be glued tight so tightly. So this kit is an ICP test from ATI. And so I'm gonna send this one off. And somewhere over here, I also have ICP tests from Fauna Marin. So here's the plan, I have all these kits. I wanna do some testing. And I've done this once already, but I wanted to do it again, because I, you know, if you do it once, that's not really proof of anything, that's more like, here are the results. But if I can do it again, and kind of recreate um, as close to similar parameters, then that would be ideal for finding out whose numbers are, are whose. And I'm very, very curious of having so many different kinds of kits and learning what is uh, what my numbers are. And you know what, it could end up being just super crazy confusing and I won't know who to believe. That's a possibility too, which is a real frustration for a hobbyist because we buy a test kit, we expect it to be right, we use it, we measure our water, we assume the number is what the reading said, and then you mail off a kit and it's like, oh, your numbers are not even close. And you're thinking, well, then who do I believe? Do I believe them? Do I believe my test kit? So. I'm going to kind of do an in-depth uh, test starting next week. I'm going to send water samples from the exact same system all at the same time, scoop it all out at once, and I'm going to send it, and then I'm going to go ahead and wait for all the results to come in, and I guess I'm going to do a spreadsheet, and I'm going to have all the columns, and I'll have to do a blog entry. I mean, I can do a video about it, but I think a blog entry is easier because you kind of really go over the information, and you can scroll back and forth and look at all the numbers and see what everyone said for potassium, what everyone said for calcium. I think it should be very good. So we have that to look forward to. Uh, thank you, Reef and Dive. I appreciate another Super Chat snuck in. Yeah, I did have some travel expenses. Actually, I did. Uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, my flight coming home was canceled on Sunday, which really shocked me because the storm had turned, the airport was not closed. In theory, there was absolutely no reason my plane should not be waiting on the tarmac for me when I show up on Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, or actually a little bit early, to take off at 10. Instead, they told me it's canceled and they were going to move me to a Wednesday flight, which I thought was a terrible decision because Wednesday was when the storm was even closer. Why would I want to be anywhere near Florida <laughs> at that point? So I ended up buying, um, I used some miles and I paid the taxes or whatever, whatever American Airlines asked for, it cost me 80 bucks out of pocket to get home immediately on Monday and I bought that flight. Going to tell you a quick little story about this bottle. So this is some hot sauce that was, it's supposed to have a label on it, but it doesn't because it got forgotten. But this was actually made from LRS. LRS does fish food, but he needed a hobby to lower his blood pressure. So he started to make his own hot sauce. And he did a video on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, and he showed how he made it. And his kitchen was gorgeous. He had all this nice fresh produce. And it was so colorful. And he, and he spent about five minutes showing how he made it and explained everything that was in it. And he said, it's not a secret and there's millions of recipes. He was making that one and he was going to uh, possibly give out samples at Macna. So I'm not a big hot sauce guy. And I told him, you know, can you set up a you know, bowl of chips and the dip in your booth so we could taste it? And he said, no, we're not doing that. And I said, okay, could you bring me a ketchup packet worth? Instead, he brought me this big bottle. So uh, 
It's got a lot of peppers in it, but it also has things like brown sugar and molasses. I'm probably gonna love it, but I haven't opened it yet. And look, he sealed it like vacuum sealed. It was really impressively done. He, he was very professional for a guy that doesn't want to sell it. <laughs> um, something new that is coming to market or it has come to market. Um, no one told me I couldn't talk about this and you know, it was on display at Macna, so I'm just gonna hold it up. It's a dosing pump from Ecotech. And this is part of their new line of uh, equipment that will work with their new uh, Mobius controller software. So this will communicate wirelessly with the app on your phone and you don't even need ReefLink. Uh, it's got the stuff inside it to make it work. On the back is this little piece that you would put on your cabinet and then you would just slide it into place. And I th he said maximum was 10 gallons and I'm thinking that's per hour. <laughs> um, and minimum was like a few milliliters. So you could use it for very slow or you could use it for continuous duty like on a calcium reactor. I didn't find out the price. I didn't actually see it run. When I walked over, it was already disconnected. So I didn't get to see the demo, but uh, you open it up. Let's see if I can not break this on camera. I'm probably gonna break it. I'm not gonna break it. I'm just gonna show it to you. <laughs> but the head can be pulled out and replaced. They said that the head assembly would last you about a year. So um, that's interesting. Can't wait to try it out. That's new. I came home with a whole bunch of Prodibio, BioClean, iodine, strontium, oh, sorry, strontium, coral bits. These are all products I use in my tank uh, every two weeks, and so I got another year's supply while I was at the show. Now we showed you that. Check this out. I got me an aerial on my uh, name badge at the show. And I earned it from going to the most Macnas. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. What had happened was I was in a room. It was one of the meetups. And they said, you know, who's been to the most Macnas? And, you know, everyone was calling out. And I was kind of not really paying super close attention. And then they said, who could beat 12 years? And so I raised my hand. And they were like, you win. And so I got to pick out a pin. And that's actually a Disney pin. So that was really cool to get. I love Ariel. I think some of you know that already. And while I was at Disney World, I got myself some treasure. So, couldn't help myself. I know this isn't reef related necessarily. Well, this one is not. But I got myself some ornaments to put on my tree this year. So I loved it. And so I got the Pixar lamp. I got... Yeah, again, not reef related, Dumbo. <laughs> this one's bigger and heavier. What is this? I already forget. Ariel with legs. They did a nice job with her face, and she's combing her hair with a spork, so I had to get her. That's a heavy one. And... My Christmas tree each year always has a bunch of saltwater related stuff on it and Star Wars because <laughs> those two make sense together. I had to get this. So you got Olaf and uh, Sven, I believe. And then finally, I believe. Oh, and then I got Mrs. Potts with Chip. So. I thought there was one other one, but I don't see it in here. Hmm. I thought I got the Nemo and Dory, but I guess I did not. All right. So that was something I got for myself. It has nothing to do with this channel. Hope you enjoyed it. While I was in the Prodibio booth, I was very surprised to see that they had a product that I hadn't heard about. And somewhere here, I have a third one. So, um, you know, they've always had these additives for like alkaline calcium, strontium, iodine, uh, biodigest, bioptim, the different bacteria. But they had something for worms and parasites. They had something for spots and velvet. 
and they had stuff for bacterial and fun fungi so uh i didn't know anything about it so i grabbed some while i was there and some of these they all have expiration dates so you got to use this one a little more quickly than usual but and the idea is that you'll use these inside a quarantine tank or a hospital tank but one of them said on the top reef safe i thought that was very interesting so this is for spots and velvet so i have to read about it and see what's going on and uh it's only going to work for a certain body of water so obviously i can't just toss it in my 400 gallon reef because i don't have enough something i've been wanting to get for a long time and i've just been procrastinating i finally picked it up this is from auto aqua this is a sensor that you'll stick on the collection cup of your skimmer and then when the cup gets full it'll kill the power to the plug which is this thing down here that your skimmer's plugged into and turn off the skimmer so the cup doesn't overflow and these things are 60 bucks i mean what a great way to keep your cabinet nice and clean and dry and just keep you know stop making a mess i mean that's that's a no-brainer so i picked that up for my nios on the small frag system okay uh let me take a break here from showing you those things I want to also tell you about some of the things I saw. The dingle hopper. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, Xtepa is a new measuring device that CoralView is distributing, and we saw the prototype. And there's actually two pieces. Um, there's, a, there's a main tester, and then I think the second part is sort of like the doser that will work in conjunction with the tester. Now, Xtepa is using ion probes to measure water. And so it's drawing water out of your tank into a beaker that holds about 50 milliliters of water. It does all the measurements with these ion probes and then it drains that water right back into your tank again. So you're not taking any water out of the system and you're not having to deal with waste. I don't know how well that's gonna work. They are planning to measure, um, I think it was four or five parameters. I believe each part of these, it's two pieces of equipment. I think each one was $800 each might have been six um it's not even out yet it's uh coming in the next few months you know maybe it'll be out in time for christmas um and then of course the price will be fixed at that point but uh a lot of interest has been you know because people are getting the reef bot people are getting mindstream people are getting trident and now this is coming out and so you know in the next couple of years you're gonna have so many choices when it comes to testing your water besides just using the average everyday test kit now that being said I do want to show you guys a picture. So let me find it really quick. Because the same Auto Aqua people had something. Oh, actually, I can show you some of the other stuff too. Okay, so let me just kind of go through my camera roll here and then share it with you guys. And I don't think I can zoom in, can I? No, it doesn't let me do anything like that. Weird. All right, so... Um, this was the line for the Apex Meetup. Will that turn sideways? Oh, look, it gets bigger. Nice. So that was the big line waiting to go in, and that line went around the corner and kept going. <laughs> All right. So this was the Ladies of Reefkeeping Meetup. Um, this was a really cool tank. I think I want to get it. It's a small tank that has this all-in-one system in the back, and it's running with LEDs, but the background is a gradient. And so what it does is it shows you, or what it, you can change the color of the background with buttons on a little controller. And it's not just solid blue. It's that blue that then goes to dark, you know, to, you know, at the base it'll be darker. And then you can use, you know, kind of a teal color of the background. You can add a reddish color. And he was even talking about possibly etching the background for some interesting permanent blurry artifacts to kind of give your tank some depth. And I believe this is like a 40 gallon aquarium. There's the little, uh, controller so it's called reef box and this is going to be a kickstarter project that's coming soon all right so let me show you guys here was me in the i'm not gonna make you watch it obviously but i was filming in the prodibio booth and here is a mind stream where you can actually see what's going on because it's clear instead of the all black that you've seen on my tank And this right here is a monster Abyss pump. This is the Abyss 1200. And that thing on the left is the driver. <laughs> it's humongous. This thing was so heavy. 
Yes, it's bigger than a toaster. That right there is a button to kind of give you a sense of scale. I don't know if that helps. That's a one inch button. This is a, and it was so, so heavy. And uh, I actually have someone, a client of mine is buying two of them for return pumps. Here's the front of it. All right. Um, so this is the Xtep I was talking about. And inside you can see there's a bunch of Camor dosing heads. There's the 50 milliliter beaker, or 80 milliliter beaker. I thought it said 50. And then right here inside this thing, uh, I can't put any markers on the screen to show you, but behind that white looking holder, there's kind of a thing with a black line and it says max. That right there is where the ion probes are. So there is the ion probe and these are the different ones that you insert and you can just pull them out. I think you'll have to replace these once a year. And they are the actual item that measures the water. And then, let's see. That's the front of it. And there's also a pH probe. Here are some of the markings for the various tubes that are going to come out of your system or come out of the box that goes to your system. So you've got the water going in, the calibrations, the osmotic water, and then the water out. So this will all be for testing. And then here were some of their additives that you'll probably be needing in conjunction with it because it's probably going to call for them. And then the one on the left is the auto balance. And that one is the one that's going to actually dose the products into your tank. And it, and here are some of the products. So it's going to be trace elements and alkalinity and calcium. And then on the one that's dosing, you can see it shows the water going in, calcium going, uh, a, f a feed of calcium solution, uh, alkalinity solution, trace solution, uh, reagent, um, and then the water coming back out again. So, I mean, this is all new stuff that we didn't actually see running, but uh, it's, it's in the works. Uh, here is a new light that the Kessel booth had that they told us nothing about. It's just a prototype. And no, that giant bottle on the top is not part of the light. <laughs> That's a big inflatable chemipure container. Uh, here is that light again from above. It's basically replacing the AP700. Sorry, I forget I have extra stuff on the screen. Uh, that was what Dorian looked like when it hit. I'm kidding, that was my weather every day. It never looked bad. Um, drinks. Okay, I need to be careful what I show you guys. <laughs> um, here's an awesome Kessel light. So look at the size of this light. I forget the number. Let's just call it the Kessel A2000 because I don't remember. Um, this monster light was lighting up the entire banner behind the stage at the banquet. And there's a guy in there for sense of scale or that microphone. And this is a super powerful light that they could dial in and adjust based on the show to make sure people could see. We had a really good keynote presentation by Vincent Chalet, who spoke about, um, well, here's a little tiny clip where it shows them taking a small coral and leaving the majority of the coral behind to continue growing. And they said, this is how coral should be taken from the ocean. And I thought that was very important. I'm trying to get this off the screen. There you go. And this is on the Great Barrier Reef, by the way, if you're wondering where he is. All right, and his presentation, let me come back to my screen for a second here. His presentation was about the importance, actually, I took a screenshot of a, someone asked me to describe what his talk was about, so I took a picture, and I'd rather just read it to you and say it correctly. Nope, that's not it. Okay, going to Facebook, one second. Because <clears throat> I posted it on my wall. Good God, I share a lot. Here we go. What was Vincent's speech about? It was about industry accountability and how badly we need it to have actual data to counter all these emotionally charged accusations that the aquarium hobby is destroying the coral reefs. And that really was his talk. And he emphasized how, you know, you've got collectors out there that ship their corals to someone that'll pay them, some kind of a wholesaler, the wholesaler then puts them in boxes and ships them to the fish stores across the nation, and then we buy them, but there's zero oversight. It's just kind of like this handshake deal type situation, and there's no data. So when uh, the uh, animal rights ag advocacies come forward and say, 
uh, 93% of all fish die within the first year. How do we refute that? We have no data. We have nothing to say other than that's not true with my tank, but that doesn't go anywhere. It does not help when you've got people screaming to their government, stop the coral collecting, stop the fish collecting. And because there's a lack of data, Vincent said, we're, we're hurting ourselves. We have no, no leg to stand on and it's our own fault. So he was really emphasizing and encouraging that we as an industry do more. So it's really not a job for us hobbyists. I'm just kind of bringing you up to date. But something has to happen on the industry level. Some kind of independent oversight committee has to come into play. Someone that has all the information and is tracking that information. And that way it can be um, used when someone says, you guys killed 100,000 Achilles tangs this year. We can say, no, that's actually not true. They were distributed. We only we only collected 10,000 this year. They were distributed to these 527 stores. Now, I mean, whatever, you know what I'm saying? But right now, we can't say anything because we don't know anything. So his talk, I mean, it really moved me. It made me want to get up and do something, and I didn't really know what, so I'm working on that. And I opened a conversation about this on my wall to get some information from a few people. And I talked with one person on the phone who's actually actively working on something already. So I'm really excited to see that there's a possibility of some forward momentum on this very important topic because none of us, none of us hobbyists say, oh my God, I need that fish so bad, I must take it from the ocean or I need such and such coral. I don't care what you have to do, get every last one out of the ocean so that I can enjoy it. That's, none of us think that way. We're like, <coughs> we're more like, oh my God, that's so pretty. I wish I had one. That's about as far as it goes in our brains normally. Okay. So we will see if uh, something comes to fruition in the coming months. Now, um, change gears right quick because, I mean, you know, I don't have any answers for that one. It's more like, you know, a, 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 des a burning desire to do something. Um, when I was in the Kessel booth, I showed you some of those lights. They also um, have the A, I think it's A360X. Maybe it's just 360X. And so that light looks like a, it's about this tall. It's about the size of a hockey puck, I guess. I don't know, I've never been hit by a hockey puck, but I think it's about that size. And I've got one over my anemone cube that hasn't been turned on yet. I couldn't get it set up before my trip. So I decided I'd get it set up afterwards. And while I was at the, their booth, they had this. So this little guy here magnetically clicks to the bottom of the light and kind of brings the beam in so it's not spreading so wide. And that's great for a tank like mine that's 24 by 24. Uh, it won't shine light across the room. It'll just keep it contained in the tank. And I can do some testing with it on and remove it and see what kind of numbers I get. So my plan is to measure some PAR measurements with my Radeon that's still in place. Then remove the Radeon, put, you know, lower the Kessel into its position, run the Kessel, measure the lighting, and then try their new uh, reflector and try and see what that does. So the Kessel 360, the big news for that light, because that year's been that light's been out for about a year, year and a half, two years? I don't know. They just released a brand new dongle that snaps on the top permanently and lets you use your phone to control the light rather than having to use their director, which was a wall mount controller. So that's exciting, and that's something I'll be playing with in the coming weeks. All right. Let me see what other pictures I wanted to show you guys. Because I had a specific thing I wanted to get to. <laughs> No, nope, that's it. That was the best. Uh, I'll quickly talk about, oh, well, let me grab that. I mean, this is the Mila's Reef channel, so I should mention this if I can find it. So, this was our first meetup. And uh, what we did was we got together on 1230 on Saturday and whoever wanted to come to the Mila's Reef meetup came. And so this group came, and actually, after the fact, I had a few, I don't say, six people, a dozen, all said, oh, I wish I could have gone, I couldn't break away from my booth, or I was too far away, or I missed it, or I forgot. So the room could have been a little bit more full. But considering that's the first time we ever had a meetup, I was pretty happy with that turnout. So we had, you know, somewhere around 26, 30 people show up. I had a few prizes to give away. I filmed part of it until my phone just gave up at the 
uh, last Saturday. I don't know if some of you tried to watch it. I didn't hook up a microphone because I was kind of hoping you could hear people in the room say things too, but that didn't work out at all. I was completely wrong. So next year's meetup, what we'll do is we'll have a mic on me and we'll have a handheld mic to go around the room with so we can just give it to people as they're communicating. And that way you'll be able to hear the whole thing until the uh, live stream cuts out <laughs> because you know, when you're streaming from inside a convention center slash hotel, the signal is not the greatest and you're, and we're literally like inside a room, inside a big building made of concrete. So, uh, you know, I was actually impressed we got any signal at first. I didn't expect that to work, but I did notice somewhere around, I don't even know what time period, but it just stopped. I had a spinning circle of death and uh, I just had to hit end stream because I couldn't do anything else because it wasn't working. But that was a, a very, oops. That was a very nice meetup. We, and it was really cool because I asked people, how many, um, how many of you are part of Club Miller's Reef? Raise your hands. And everyone raised their hand. And I didn't expect that answer. I thought, you know, 75% would. And then there'd be a few others that just like my channel or, or like uh, my website. But it was everyone. And then I asked the group specifically if, you know, for some feedback on the channel. And I said, would you like the videos to be shorter or longer? You know, I really would like to know where your thoughts are when it comes to getting these. And I swear, unanimously, everyone in the room just said, longer. <laughs> I was like, wow. Again, didn't expect that. I find that very interesting because in this world of instant information, uh, I know everyone wants to see things quickly and they want to get to the point quickly and they don't want to waste their time. And the fact that you guys are willing to kind of sit through, uh, you know, these long live streams or listen to it while you're driving or, you know, working on your tank, I appreciate that you're willing to do that. And I do know that we share a lot of tidbits within these live streams where I answer a question or I tell a story and these, and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I listened because I caught that one little nugget of truth. And yeah, I bury the nuggets in the live streams. <laughs> That's totally intentional. <laughs> uh, one thing that I did hear from a lot of people was that you really are like you are on the show. And I, I don't even know how to be different. I don't even know how someone could maintain a fake persona for an hour and a half straight on a live stream and not end up showing you who they truly are. So I, you know, I've, I, as I told the group, I said, if my back is hurting, you're gonna know I'm not doing well. If I'm hating my tank, you're gonna know exactly why I hate the tank. If I'm loving my tank, I'll tell you why I love my tank. And that's just, that's how I'm wired. I just tell you how it is. And I tend to be the person that you guys think you know. And I'm not gonna disappoint you in person in theory. I mean, occasionally something horrible may happen, but for the most part, I haven't, you know, made anyone think, oh my God, he's nothing like that channel, you know, so thank God. Um, Mindstream gave me a water bottle, so that's kind of awesome. Is that upside down? So that was nice. Know what's in your water. And, uh, oh, I got a bunch of shirts. So because I went to Disney, I had to get some Disney shirts. So I don't have all my stuff because I've already been using things this week, but this is one I got. And I thought it was super cute. It's got their butts. And I also, oh yeah. So I signed up for next year's Macna already because I always do that when I'm at the show. So Macna next year is August 28th to 30th. It's in Phoenix, Arizona. And you wanna sign up right now. So you have, today is the seventh. You have until the 16th to buy your ticket. So buy it right now, even if you don't know if you're going, because the price is only gonna go up and up and up as we get closer to the event. Right now is the lowest price. I think it's 139, which is still a lot of money. And if for some reason you can't go, you can transfer it, you can sell the ticket. So you're not gonna be ripped off. So I highly, highly recommend that you buy your Macna ticket, go to Macna, no, masna.org, and you'll find the buy tickets link right on there. And after this video is up on YouTube, I'll go ahead and I'll put the link in there for you guys so you can uh, get to it easily so that way you can get it. So I got that one. And because I really like Goofy, I got another Goofy shirt. So again, same as before coming through the shirt. That was a few there. And I'm wearing this shirt, which you saw I got at the meetup. At the banquet, everyone got themselves the Kessel uh, little rag that you can use for you know blotting up water. And this is that dongle I was telling you guys about. Because Kessel was the big sponsor for this event. I also got myself more of these. I love these things. So this is a handy towel, obviously, from Apex. But it has the little stretchy thing. So you can clip it on you, 
and work around your aquarium, just reach down and you know the towel is tethered to you. I use this thing a lot. So I got two of them. <laughs> this is another meetup shirt. I got the orange one as well. And on the back side, this is what you have not seen on my back right now. Apex, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Neptune Systems brought 30 Tridents to Machina to sell. And I'm sure they sold every last one of them. BRS was there, and they were doing this huge raffle, and I, I just didn't understand what was going on. Well, check this out. This is a legal thing. BRS ships product all over the U.S., <clears throat> but the only persons that have to be taxed are those in their state. So if I were to order from Texas, you were to order from California, there's no sales tax. But as soon as they go to a trade show and sell anything, they then get embraced by the Nexus law, which is something that came about, a few, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago, 10 years ago. And basically, if you just set up a booth for more than 24 hours in any other state, you have to start collecting tax there. And so now all of a sudden, BRS has to figure out if you're from that state or this state or every state, and every state has a different sales tax rate, which is even worse. So they said, no, we're not selling anything. Everything we brought, we're giving away. And they gave away or raffled off um, tridents <laughs> and other things. And people were getting shirts. And here's the crazy thing. Um, you had to wear the shirt to win your prize. And one person came up to me and said, I wasn't wearing my shirt and they wouldn't give me my prize. That is just not right. And I was like, well, I mean, you kind of knew the rule. I mean, but I, I understand why you're upset and I, it sucks not to get what you, you won. But at the same time, if everyone else in the room is wearing the shirt and you're not, I don't know what to tell you. <coughs> um, I got one of these shirts. So this is a uh, one-off. And because the Trident, before it became real, was called a unicorn. And so I got the unicorn shirt while I was there as well. I've got plenty of shirts for the next year. I also got, this is really cool. You guys know my, my app, Reef Trace? There's a Reef Trace shirt. So Reef like a pro. And then down here at the bottom, it shows the logo, Reef Trace. And on the back side are some of the, the screens you see. And uh, got some corals at the very bottom. So I wore that, um, I think, Saturday afternoon. So that was kind of cool. If you don't have Reef Trace, uh, you should get it. It's uh, 3 dollars 4 dollars I think it's 4 dollars And it's iOS and Android. Uh, it lets you track all of your water parameters, lets you find the closest fish store within 45 minutes of you, or 45 miles. Um, it links to my Critter ID. There's a marketplace. Uh, there's notes and reminders. There's a lot of beneficial stuff in that app. You, if you don't have it, you need it. I told you guys I did the Prodibio interview. I've been actually a Prodibio guy now for uh, nine years in a row. And so I am actually a Prodibio ambassador, even though nobody knows it. So I'm part of the program. So at some point, you'll see me wearing this shirt. And it's the ambassador shirt. So that's kind of cool. And then Live Aquaria just loves me <laughs> and gave me this awesome shirt. So this one here has the beautiful peppermint angel fish on it. And you know, I know if I wear this, you're gonna think I work at Live Aquaria. I do not. All right. What else did I come home with that I haven't told you about? Okay, here's something new. I don't know it yet. These are glueless frag plugs. And the instructions are inside it. I haven't opened it up yet. But I believe basically you put the frag into the black part and then push the plug in the bottom and it like locks it into place. You don't have to glue it. And this would be really good for like leathers and soft corals rather than, you know, especially things that are slimy. You know, you could just put them in here and have it kind of grip. And I believe the black parts are 3D printed. So that is something. It's called Frag Gripper. Um, it's found at reefstew.com if you want to learn more. Um. All right, what else can I tell you? What time, how are we doing on time? Uh, 44 minutes. Okay, let me think. Let's see. All right, so let me talk about some more products that I saw. And let me tell you some of this. There was so much going on at this Macna that I actually did not see probably one third of the vendor hall, which blows me away. I just can't believe it. And I was really saddened by the fact that some vendors broke down their giant booths in advance, like early, like Saturday afternoon, they're breaking down 
and packing up their stuff because they were catching a flight out that night because they were worried about Dorian. And it just made it feel like it wasn't Saturday in the morning. It felt like Sunday. It felt weird. And I didn't even participate in the raffle this year. I just spent as much time as I could talking to people. I met everybody. Uh, I saw a lot of my friends. I joke I have about 800 friends. And I, um, I saw them and then a lot of new people, people that had never been to Macna before that were enjoying it. There was uh, the hotel itself was really nice. The, uh, there was restaurants inside the hotel. So you had access to you know, fine dining to less expensive fare. There was like a type of a food court where you could get wrapped sandwiches and drinks and it wasn't too horribly expensive. So that was nice because I usually don't like to leave and go off looking for a restaurant. I just wanna grab something, get back in there. And I had people stop me and I had other people say, I didn't want to interrupt you. And I was like, no, you should have grabbed me because I'm only there a little bit. And someone posted on, my, uh, on this YouTube channel that he said, wow, I had no idea it'd be that hard to talk to you at Macna. You are so popular. <laughs> And I was like, he should have grabbed me. And he actually said, I almost did, but then I was worried. And so I didn't do it. And I was like, ah. But no, I, uh, I do try to talk to everyone as much as I can. I try not to ignore anyone. Um, I, this was funny. I had a, this beautiful lady. She sees me coming toward her and she says, stop. I have to take a picture with you to make my husband jealous. And I was like, let's do it. <laughs> so we were taking this picture. It was her and her daughter. Her daughter was adorable. Just, I don't know. She was, you know, like this top, you know, I can't show you how high she was because she was way down there, but she was way down here. And so what happened was we've got our phone out, or she's got her phone out. And so we squatted down to take this picture near her daughter. So her daughter's in the shot and she's holding the phone out and she says, okay, smile. And she hits the button and on the screen it says 10, nine, eight. And she's like, oh my God, there's a countdown. And so the three of us, including her daughter, were all making these silly faces. And then finally, as it hit one, we all smiled and she got one nice picture. So that was a fun little uh, moment. And it turns out she wasn't trying to make her husband jealous like you're thinking, because why would I do that? No, she was uh, wanting to make him jealous because he apparently watches the channel and enjoys it. And he would have liked to have met me. So because I spent five minutes talking to her, by the time uh, we were wrapping up, he showed up and I got to say hi. So yeah, always come say hi whenever you can. You know, just look for me. If I'm literally in the middle of taping an interview, yes, don't interrupt me. But other than that, just come say hi or, or let, you know, wave to me or get, you know, flag me down or throw, me, throw a towel at me. I'll, I'll look up <laughs> so we can see each other. Um, I interviewed several different vendors and my friend Ian was there and he brought this amazing camera gear. So normally I just walk around my iPhone and I film everything. And Ian says, well, I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna be your B-roll. And he shows up with his rig with two handles. There's this thing on his shoulder. There's a, um, there's a camera. There's a monitor. There's a, a boom mic. There was battery packs. I and mean, there was this crazy thing. People are like, gee, Mark, you really stepped up your game. And I'm like, yeah, look, he's my B roll. And then I, I joke, I'm like, here's my A roll. <laughs> so anyway, that arrived uh, yesterday. He's, he sent all the files to me on a small uh, external hard drive and I've got to offload those onto my computer and then start editing. And I'm actually going to see things I missed at Macna because he walked around filming while I was busy talking. So that'll be really cool to see that. And I'll be able to build some videos for you guys and show you some more of the visuals from the show because there was a lot to see. All right, let's see, let's see. Um, this is interesting. Okay. so. I, t I talked to the guys in the Dell Tech booth. Dell Tech? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that booth is Dell Tech. And I told him I've been running the Clarity for a couple of weeks. And he said, oh, are you going to use a bigger roll? And I said, well, I guess, you know, if I get my hands on one. And he said, well, then you're going to need this. So he gave me this straw that, uh, or that goes around one of the screws because apparently the bigger roll must put some kind of additional stress on how it stretches the core of the Clarity. And so you would put this around a threaded screw. You know, it's got wing nuts on each end and reinforce it so the acrylic stays straight and doesn't bow and cre create a curl. So I was given this while I was at the show. And I'm, I'm guessing whoever has a Clarity may be getting one of these. Or maybe when you order a big roll, you get one. I, I don't know. He didn't tell me anything. He says, you need this. And he handed it to me. So I took it. And I think that's pretty much everything interesting. Oh, I did get this. So this just happens off the cuff. I was walking around Sunday. They're breaking down 
and uh, I saw this box, and all you could see was this. You know, the, it was a box of a bunch of these. And I was like, what is that? So these are little tiny flasks. The company is Aquaholic Aquaculture, Aquaculture, and they were filling these up for you on the spot with phytoplankton or uh, rotifers, and they had these casks, these barrels, you know, the, the wooden barrels with a window in the front, and you could see the solution, and there was a little spigot, and you'd fill up your little bottle to go, and it's, an, it's a glass bottle. And she said, you need one. <laughs> I was like, no, seriously, you're packing up, I get it. And like, no, no, you must take it. And she told me like four times, so I said, okay, I'll take it. So she gave me this cute little bottle, but then she gave me this. So this is like what you have with the bartender. So now when I fill it up with Crown Royal, I can literally dose myself properly. Very exciting. I think that's it. Oh, and I bought something for my grandson. Do you guys want to see? I had to get him this because he's my grandson. So this was inside Magic Kingdom. He hasn't seen this yet, so I'll show it to you guys. So this is a Buzz Lightyear that blows bubbles at the top of his helmet, and you just fill it up with bubble solution, and it's just a fun toy. So I got this for him. You know, he's just over two years old, so I figured this is a great toy. It's big enough he won't choke on it, and it's quiet enough that his parents won't hate me. <laughs> so I got him that. He loves Toy Story. So I want to get him that. So that um, he will be getting soon, as soon as I see him again. All righty. Um, OK, so let me just throw this on the screen, because this is the kind of stuff I'm like, ah, whatever. Um, does anyone think that Phoenix is going to be too hot? Well, yes, it's going to be crazy hot. But we are inside an air-conditioned hotel. We're inside an air-conditioned convention center. The only thing that we're going to hate is going from the hotel to the convention center. That quarter mile or eighth of mile or whatever it was i saw a quick video clip last night or yesterday kevin erickson is in phoenix right now and he was showing the convention center and then he panned and showed us the hotel so we're gonna have to walk outside Ugh. but i just go in and i stay i don't keep going out so i'm not going to feel the air until i absolutely must so i wouldn't sweat that honestly and i don't sweat i really you shouldn't have to worry about it you know every single year at mac now we go somewhere and it's air conditioned and we're comfortable and the only place not to go is apparently is Animal Kingdom. <laughs> they don't know what AC is. Even the animals didn't want to come out. All righty. I feel like there's more things I should be telling you about Macna. But hey, why don't I answer some of your questions? Let's take the next uh, 30 minutes and we'll answer some of your questions and then uh, we'll wrap this up. We won't do the abbreviated live stream. People don't like that. Keep seeing this hair. Oh, it's part of my head. That makes more sense. Look at that. No questions. <laughs> Reef and Dive says, you have an entirely new wardrobe. Yeah, I got so many shirts this year that literally I don't need. And I have so many shirts. And typically, I only save shirts I care about. In other words, they have to have meaning, they have to have an experience, they have to have a story behind them, or I don't keep them. And so I've got, you know, all these different shirts from this show, and they all are, it's not like somebody handed me a freebie, it's like, oh, got a shirt. You know, I literally wanted that shirt, and when they said, here you go, I was very happy to get it. I have shirts from Comic-Con, uh, the occasional shirt from the store, very rare, and most of my shirts are from Macna. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Robert says that BRS charges tax on their website even if you're not local? So every customer pays sales tax? Are you serious? I didn't know that. Hmm. Oh, I, I, I made a mistake this week. So I was ordering supplies for my website because you guys know I sell things. Um, shameless plug in three, two, one. Buy things from milosreef.com and help me eat. <laughs> um, so I was ordering inventory. And I ordered uh, more ICP tests, like I told you, and I bought the uh, magnifiers. This is the flipper magnifier that hangs on the side of your tank with a big magnet on the inside. This is on the outside, and you can put it up against the glass and see things up close through the magnifying glass. So I ordered that. I ordered a bunch of stuff, right? And I also ordered calcium reactor media, 
which uh, I use Reborn. Well, I ordered Reborn and I got four bags of this, and this is not what I use. And it's so heavy, it's not even worth shipping back because of the weight and ordering the one I do want. So I'm going to have to try to use this one. Well, it turns out this is called Little Reborn. It's like, oh, I didn't even know this existed. So I've got four bags, which means three are on the shop and one is for my tank. Bummer. I really prefer the larger stuff. This is what I use, which are the larger nuggets. And uh, see, it doesn't say little on it. But I'm stuck. I'm, I'm going to have to use what is here. I also ordered more top-off kits, more um, of the uh, flipper scraper magnets, cleaning magnets for nano tanks as well as regular tanks. So that is, uh, all these things are going in inventory. I also got something new. Of course, I can't possibly reach that. So this will be added to my website later today or tomorrow. This is a huge 100 pack of nori from Two Little Fishies. And I ordered it from my tank because uh, I need more nori. And you know, I thought, oh, I could buy it from Amazon. I could go to an Asian food store. But I was like, I'll just use Two Little Fishies because they're made for aquariums. And that way there's no question. And basically, you know, 100 sheets is 100 days for my tank, right? And this right here will uh, retail for $39. So um, if you feel like that's a lot, you don't have to buy it. But <laughs> some people might say, man, I'd love to buy it in bulk. This sounds great. Thanks for putting on your site. At least that is how I look at it. All right. Let me scroll down here and see if there's any questions yet. Uh, Fishman says, can you make a tank worth 50 bucks? Make a tank worth 50 bucks. It would be really small. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Ta actually, to be honest, I tell people if you're trying to set up a new tank, it's going to cost you $47 a gallon. So your $50 would get you a one gallon container, and that's before you add livestock. But you know, you can find things half price when you uh, look at used equipment, and that'll save you some money. And you might find someone that's getting out of the hobby, and that'll save you some money as well. So you can just look for that. But yeah, 50, that's really low. I'd, I'd like to see you spend the 50 on a quarantine tank. That way all your new fish don't infect your bigger tank, and that way your stuff stays safe. Reef and Dive says, I've set up my automatic RODI with solenoid and switches connected to the breakout box in the Apex. Any other cool ideas of what else I could use the breakout box for? Yeah, actually, there's a whole bunch of ideas that are out there on the web, and you know, you could probably stick that right into Google and, and come up with like 15 threads. But uh, for me, I have big buttons that I push on the side of my tank. They're on the, the side over here. And I push that one button, and it stops the return pump, and it stops the skimmer. And it makes it stay off for 10 minutes. And then the return pump turns on, and the skimmer still off for five more minutes till the water lowers down in the sump where it's normal. And then the skimmer comes to life. That's one thing on my breakout box. Um, another thing on my breakout box is when my waste collector that my protein skimmer drizzles into, you know, just dribbles in a little bit at a time, when that becomes full, a float switch rises and it turns off one of the pumps on the skimmer so it can no longer export any fluid out of my tank, which has worked out great when the skimmer wanted to go crazy or when the skimmer was just not been cleaned for a while and the waste collector collected whatever that thing holds, a gallon of the solution. So those are a couple things for breakout boxes. Another thing some people use are momentary switches that are tied to the breakout box to where if you open the cabinet doors, the button pops out and a light comes on automatically so you can see everything inside your stand. And then when you close it, the, it pushes the little plunger back in and it turns off the light inside your stand. And so that's another cool way of using the breakout box. You can put up to six things on a single breakout box. All right. B Reefer asks, I just want to hear your take on coral pricing at the moment. Over here, it's becoming more and more expensive, even for non-exclusive corals. Uh, that's the same over here. <laughs> uh, you just have to be a judicious customer and decide what you're willing to pay. And occasionally, I will go nuts and buy something expensive. But for the most part, I'm pretty, uh, I don't do that. I pretty much say no. I like, thank you for letting me know, and I just move on with my life. For example, if I want to get eight cans for my tank, I'm gonna wanna get frags that are about 20 bucks each. And so, you know, they may have a bunch and I'll like, look, how much would it be if I buy five? And if they say something like $100, I'm all in, you know? But if they said, well, this one's 80 and this one's 70 and this one's 40, I'm like, eh. So I'll decide if I want one or none. 
and that's how I handle it. I don't get sucked into the whole, this is worth 600, this is worth 1200. When you frag it, you'll make your money back. I don't believe any of that because I don't frag anything. I just hoard it. I keep it forever. I try to keep it alive as long as possible. And uh, usually <laughs> my corals live longer than the fish store I bought it from and the store goes out of business. So uh, I don't get caught up in the, in the money game when it comes to buying corals. Sometimes I get corals from friends, other hobbyists. Sometimes I get it from a fish store. And uh, sometimes I'll do it online, but almost never. Uh, most of the time, it's going to be like I described, or maybe at like Aquashella or at Macna or you know, Reef of Palooza. Or if I'm giving a talk at an event, like a frag swap, I might walk around and go crazy. <laughs> I remember when I was in Florida once, I, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, look at all these nice corals. That's really cool. That's nice. I like it. Mm, that's pretty, too. Ooh, that's nice, yeah. And, you know, I wasn't buying anything. I was like, I have to take a plane. I don't care. No way. Not interested. And I went to this one guy's table, <clears throat> and he had a purple gorgonian that was about that tall in a skinny bag of water. And I was like, oh, my God. Because, you know, people are used to getting a frag this big or maybe this big. And to get a gorgonian this tall would look amazing, and it would be instantly in my tank, and you'd see it from afar. And uh, I said, how much is that? And he said, $5. I'm like, $5? Are you kidding me? I was like, I'll take it. So I bought that. And then, you know, the floodgates opened and I bought 23 frags that day and came home with a suitcase full of coral. So, uh, you know, occasionally I'll go a little crazy. But for the most part, I try to behave. But yeah, uh, don't let the pricing affect you. Really, uh, I don't know, something about capitalism. You know, it's sort of like the customer dictates the price. You know, people could say I want this much, but if you're not willing to pay it, if no one's willing to pay it, they'll have to come down. But, you know, you have to decide what you can live with. <clears throat> for example, I would have loved to have bought the peppermint angel fish for $25,000. I don't have that money. I would have had to use three credit cards to get it. I can't do it. Sorry. Someone tried to call during our live stream. They should know better. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, Brad says, can you mix the reborn? I can. I can add the smaller grain on top, but it'll drizzle through the bigger stuff to, and end up on the bottom. I'm basically going to just have to deal with it. Uh, what my calcium reactor needs in the bottom is a sponge that that smaller media goes on so it doesn't go through the tiny holes in the base plate. And I haven't used that sponge in probably five years. So I'm just like, great, now i got to find that sponge. Uh, Blake says, I'm currently in the middle of a water change and the salinity in the tank is 1.023. My water change water is 1.026. Just add the water or what? <clears throat> yeah, you can add the water. The fact that you're a little bit higher is not going to affect your tank greatly. You know, ideally we want everything to match. You want your temperature to match, you want your pH to match, and you want your salinity to match. And if those three match, you can change as much water as you want and not affect the tank. But, uh, Let's say you're dealing with a 30 gallon tank and you're changing five gallons of water and the salinity is 1.026 in the new water. That'll be all right. You could add some water to dilute it down more and get it closer to 1.023, but that small water change won't hurt you. If you continually keep doing 1.026 water changes, your tank is gonna come up higher and higher over time until it finally actually hits 1.026. Uh, okay, so Salto is asking, what's the difference with the different media sizes for Reborn? Uh, in the old days, we used to use something, I think only one company sold it. It was called ARM, Aragonite Reactor Media. And Carib C is the one that sold it. And I bought jugs and jugs, you know, pounds and pounds of the stuff and used it. And it's very small and it would just dissolve away as the calcium reactor does its job. But I discovered using the bigger grade uh, media just worked better. And so after a while, ARM came out with like nuggets. And I was like, I'll take the nuggets. Quit giving me the mush. Because it kind of looks like crushed coral. I didn't want that anymore. And I just felt like the water flowed through it better. It stayed clean longer. It just was better. And so I've been using these larger pieces ever since. But I'm stuck. <laughs> Unless you guys want to buy it so I can order more. <laughs> it's not going to not do its job. It's just not what I wanted. Uh, I actually have a picture on my website of what I sell. Now I have to update the picture and say, oh, by the way, you're getting this. And who knows if it'll move. I have no idea. Uh, Wilkins says, where did you buy your tank? If we're talking about this tank, I got it from Marineland. 
and they no longer make that tank. Are you planning on making a sump design specifically for the Clarisy? No, David, I won't do that. Uh, what I pretty much have been doing with anyone that wants to run the Clarisy is I will build the sump with a spot for the Clarisy and I'll make a stand to get it to the right depth of water. But that way, if for some reason the customer no longer wants to run it, uh, they just changed their mind, they're going a new direction, they don't have a piece of their sump they can no longer use. And I just feel that's really important because if you create this spot and have these acrylic channels built in and there's this box and everything's flowing a certain way and then you stop using it, you have this weird section that's being wasted. And I don't wanna put anyone in that predicament. I tend to build sumps that are functional rather than fancy. I mean, I do my best to make them beautiful and, you know, and, and make you like them, but they literally are not like a lot of the sumps on the market where they've cut out the shape of a shark or something that the water flows through or they use different colors. I tend to always use clear acrylic so I can make sure the two pieces of acrylic glued properly because I can see the seam, which you can't with colored. Um, and I try to make areas big rather than small. I don't like little tiny cubbies where the water slingshots from zone to zone to zone. I want there to be room for the skimmer and the water to drain in. And then I want a big refugium and I want you know a return zone. And as some of you know, I actually have the skimmer on one end, the refugium on the other, and then the water flows in the middle to the return pump that goes back up. So if I were to make more compartments, you know, and steal space for like a top off container, uh, you'll end up finding you don't have room for the reactor you want to put in, or there's absolutely no room to put a fan tray, for example, because you have all these things coming up. So no, I won't make a sump specifically for that, but there are other companies that have. Geo has made one. Um, I think Synergy has made one. So there's some other companies that will do that if that's what you're looking for. Uh, Casey Reese says, what do you think about sea dwelling creatures having a new deal with exotic reef imports? And how do you think that'll affect the industry? Actually, it's concerning. When you have two major wholesalers combining into a single entity, and you know that's as much as I know, I know nothing specific, but if they're all coming into one building, that tells me they're not carrying near the inventory they used to carry. And uh, so what are they trying to do? They're trying to have one place to rent instead of two places they're trying to share the utility bills you know I, I don't know I mean I don't know what that means for the industry I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing sometimes mergers happen and uh, we'll have to see in the coming months how it plays out I mean most of us won't even know because we buy from fish stores and so that's that's who the fish stores are talking to so I guess maybe you'll hear things from your fish store owner telling you whether things are good or bad now that there's been this change I, that's the only way I'm gonna find anything out I'll be asking questions but it's not going to affect me directly. It won't affect 99% of people on this channel either because we don't actually deal directly with wholesalers. Chris says, what affordable equipment do you recommend to adjust the pH? To adjust it? Um, okay, so your pH of your tank is based on salinity, temperature, alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. If you get all of those right, your pH will take care of itself. On my website that actually is called don't chase the pH because a lot of people want to have a certain number. And for example, if let's say you bought a bottle of pH buffer 8.3 and then you poured like the entire bottle into, you know, because it's powder typically, you pour it into a bottle and you stir it up and make it liquid and then you hook up a dosing pump and you're trying to constantly dose to keep your pH at 8.3 all the time you'll discover that your alkalinity is shooting up through the sky. It's just going higher and higher and higher because that is what raises pH. So uh, we usually tell most hobbyists, stop buffering your tank, stop putting in the 8.3, stop using a pH test kit to measure pH because they're notoriously incorrect. If you're gonna measure pH, I would highly recommend, at the very least, the American Pinpoint pH meter, which kind of looks like the size of your cell phone, it's twice as thick, of course, and it has a pH probe and it uses a nine volt battery, but they even have a power plug to keep it running 24 hours a day, you know, continuously. And you can use that to look at your pH, daytime, nighttime, middle of the night, you know, anytime you want, there's a display on there and it'll show you your tank is 7.9, your tank is 7.8, your tank is 8.3. And so you can see what's happening and you can even see what happens to your pH after you dose alkalinity and you can watch the pH shoot up briefly and then trickle back down 
as that solution has hit your system and got near the meter and then flowed through and into the rest of the tank. But we don't typically do anything to control the pH on a reef tank, specifically like I believe you're thinking. Elmer, thank you for tuning into the show, and I hope you get some good rest. Um, Debbie says, my skimmer intake is slurping. I cleaned it and did a vinegar bath. It is still doing it. It's not skimming as well because of it. It just started and it's driving me crazy. Uh, yeah, maybe the intake, the thing you cleaned, there's usually a, a large round item with a, a hole about that big in the front, and there's a straw sticking out the side and your tubing goes on it. I would remove the tubing and look inside that little straw and make sure there's not salt creep in there. That could be a possibility that it's clogged and air is not getting sucked in properly, and so the pump is not sucking it in. Um, also, you want to look at the cleaning, ma um, the cleaning, the magnet inside with the impeller. Make sure that it's spinning freely, that it's spinning continuously, that it literally is spinning the same rate, not like surging, 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 or doing some weird thing. Uh, I would look at those things, and maybe you'll find the uh, solution. Dave says, how's the battle against Aptasia going? I'm still losing. Well, I've been ignoring it. <laughs> you should copy me. Glenn Smith says, I put half a mug of carbon in a sock in the sump and replaced it a week later. Some SPS tips look like their tips turned white. Does carbon strip elements and goodness out of the water causing this? Uh, yeah, actually it does, but that's not what happened. What happened was you put your, your uh, carbon, your granulated activated carbon inside a sock, and the water is dumping into the sock and it's pummeling it. And it's releasing, it, it's just, it's breaking it up. It's sending dust into your tank. And that stuff can irritate corals. It can irritate fish. So whenever someone runs carbon, I tell them to put it in a reactor, not inside a sock, not just a mash bag laying in the bottom of the tank or the sump. It should be literally in a reactor where water's flowing through, the media isn't moving, and the water's coming out crystal clear and going into your system. I also did a whole video about this, and I've got two articles on my website written by a really smart guy that uh, I got permission to post permanently on my website. So feel free to read that. It's uh, granulated activated carbon in the reef aquarium. He recommends very slow flow through it, and I guarantee you your flow through your sock was not slow enough and probably caused some of the problems. But just running carbon doesn't hurt corals. Matter of fact, we do need to do it. I would recommend at least once a month a half a cup, you know, like a half a measuring cup per 50 gallons on your tank, and, you know, it's good for a few days. And as soon as you're, after the three or four days passes, just remove it from the system and clean everything up and get it ready for next month. Jason says, are you planning on keeping the Trident, the Mindstream, or both? Are you planning some kind of new water testing tech? Well, for now, I'm I mean, the Trident's mine. Of course I'm keeping it. The uh, Mindstream is mine also. I, <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to try and take it from me. And uh, they are, actually, I, I talked with the programmer last night about some of these ideas I was thinking of. And he wrote me back and goes, oh my god, that's fantastic. Yes, do it. So, uh, you know, I'll tell you guys more about it later, but... Uh, yeah, that's coming. Uh, that, so, no, I'm keeping those. And I actually like having both because I can open up both apps um, basically on my computer, and then I can look at them side by side. And, I, and it also works on my phone too. But uh, I can look at them side by side and can compare certain numbers. I can compare pH. I can compare temperature. I can compare salinity. Um, I can compare calcium, magnesium. And then the Mindstream also checks potassium, oxygen levels, CO2 levels, ammonia levels. So there's a lot of extra stuff on there. So uh, very exciting technology. And then who knows what's next? You know, the reef bot could cover things like nitrate and phosphate, but what if the Mindstream adds nitrate? That'll take care of that one for me, and I won't have to think about it anymore. You know, I can just look at a reading and see what it does. And I don't have to worry about, like, a kit going bad because you have to replace the disc every month. So uh, you should always have the latest, and you won't have things that are worn out giving you false readings is my hope. Uh, Brad says, I have a trigger sump, especially, uh, specifically the Triton 44 version. It doesn't have space for filter socks, and I'd like to run them from time to time. Would you build an acrylic stand just for filter socks? I can do that. Um, something else I did for one person was I made them a sock box. So it was like a standalone unit that they put next to their sump. Their tanks would drain into that, and then it would go through the socks and then plumb through that into the sump. That's another method. I know there's not a lot of room inside the trigger sump, but if we can come up with something that you feel will fit, I'll be happy to help you out. <laughs> uh, 
Elmer, <laughs> Elmer's saying it would be a nice to, idea to make an ASMR episode. Can you imagine me talking for an hour and a half, whispering for an hour and a half and crunching on potato chips? It would drive you guys crazy. You would uh, unsubscribe. Speaking of which, please subscribe to this channel if you're not. Uh, I appreciate every subscription and every thumbs up. Those are always greatly appreciated. Also, I'm going to throw this on the screen if I can find it. This and this. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> this. There we go. I need to make that one graphic. Uh, Club Mila's Reef, right now there's about 60 of you waiting to join. Uh, I will get those approved today. And uh, we have a really good group of people helping each other every single day. Very friendly group. We don't allow anyone to be negative. Uh, that's just how I run it. There's plenty of other groups if you don't like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we've had a lot of people join that came from YouTube, specifically because you only get to talk to me for, you know, an hour, where on the group you can catch me every single day. And you'll see the things I share. So I, I highly recommend that. I also recommend, I tell everyone, follow this page. So important. Um, see if I can grab it. Don't know if I can. Ugh, there's things on my screen in my way. I can't get to it. Anyway, um, follow the facebook.com slash Mila's Reef page because I share a lot of really good information on there that's not in the group. So people are in the group. They don't know there's stuff happening on the main page. Also, whenever you're trying to reach me, you can message me from my business page, facebook.com slash Milo's Reef, or you can click on contact us on my website and I'll reply to your email. And I've been really good about keeping up with email, so if you haven't heard from me, that means you need to send it again. Now let's see if I can get this off of here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Nano Reef has a question. I need to look that up. Hang on a second. Red Sea 425. Because I don't know everything. Red Sea 425 XL. 112 gallons. So you're going from a 30 gallon tank. He's asking, uh, I'm getting my 425 XL delivered tomorrow. I'm upgrading from a 30 gallon. Any advice on cycling and the swap? You're moving from a 30-gallon system into this 112-gallon tank, so you're tripling your water volume. And at the same time, you're not going to move all that same water over. You're going to save some of it, just as long as you keep your livestock wet. And then you're going to set up your new tank, <clears throat> and you're going to cycle it like a normal person, which there's different ways. You can use the Fritz Zyme, which is their instant uh, type of bacteria. Uh, that one, by the way, in case you didn't know that, when you use that, you have to put fish in the tank within 24 hours of pouring that in, or you wasted it. It won't survive without the fish present. Um, you can use Dr. Tim's uh, bacteria as well to start it. I, myself, I'm old school. I throw a shrimp in the tank and let it rot for three days. Just a big, huge shrimp from the deli. I say, give me your biggest shrimp. They give me one shrimp. I pay a dollar. I throw it in the tank. I let it rot. And after three days, I take it out of the tank, and there's plenty of ammonia, and then the cycle works its way through. In about three weeks, uh, the tank's ready for livestock. But if you are trying to move everything out of the 30-gallon, and into the new 425XL on the same day, that's a tank transfer. You're not gonna be cycling anything. Matter of fact, you're gonna do everything you can to avoid a cycle at all costs. You're not gonna like, expose the rock to air. You're uh, going to scoop out all the live sand and move you know, clean live sand into the new tank. And when I say clean live sand, that means you didn't wash it. So if you wanna use brand new bags of live sand and pour that in the tank, add some water, move the rock in, add more water so the rock is submerged and can't be exposed to air, then add your livestock. That's a transfer, and you can do that all in the same day, and you will not have a cycle. But if you leave rock sitting out on a tarp and you're trying to putty it together or something and it's exposed to air for hours and hours, you'll create a cycle. If you move a lot of dirty sand out of an existing tank into your new tank, you're going to unleash a lot of crap, which can lead to a cycle. So we want to avoid those things. And I hope that helps. <clears throat> Raj, I didn't get to see you last weekend in a conversation, but I saw you across the room and you took a picture, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Raj has been taking pictures of people at Macna for a long time, and I always take pictures of product. And so he always shares all these happy people, and I'm thinking, wow, I'd never take a picture of a human being. So uh, you, you do a great job at that. Keep it up.
Bobby says, I have a question. I did a water change on two tanks I have, and one tank is low pH and one tank has high ammonia. What should I do? I think you need to do some more testing because water changes don't do those things. Um, neither one does that. Now, if your new water is lacking alkalinity, like I was talking about earlier, your pH will be lower on that water. Also, pH changes throughout the day. Like if you did the water change this morning, the pH in your tank was already crazy low because the lights haven't come on yet. And then, you know, seven o'clock tonight, your pH is much higher. So we need to know more about your pH entirely. What, what is the number now? What is it normally at that time? I try to always recommend, if you're gonna test for pH and not have a continuous probe that measures around the clock, then you always wanna measure at the same time, like 7 p.m. every single day. Because if you check at five in the morning, it's gonna be way different. Your, your mind will explode. You'll think everything's dying. And it's because the pH is low during the, the, the late night hours. And then the ammonia doesn't come from water changes. So if it did, maybe there's ammonia going through your RODI system because the city was working on the pipes in your neighborhood. But uh, you shouldn't have any ammonia in your RODI water and you shouldn't have any ammonia in your brand new mixed salt water. So I guess test your tanks again and test your brand new mixed salt water and see if anything shows up that could explain what kind of weird things you're coming across. <clears throat> Macy, congratulations on getting your new Trident. Casey says, I'm going to have to go back to work. See you at Akoshella. I will see you there. Um, Akoshella is in about three weeks. It's in Chicago. I am hosting Celebrity Jeopardy. That'll be fun. I'm also giving a talk about aquascaping with Dwayne Ostrike, who you've seen on this channel. So we're going to put together a fresh presentation because we've kind of covered it before and I kind of want all new stuff. I might even reach out to Club Mealers Reef to get some um, feedback from you guys about what you would like to see included in an aquascaping presentation that we may not have remembered to include. Adrian says, do you recommend a powder blue tang? I've read they're prone to diseases and I really like, like how they look. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Um, they're prone to ick. They are literally ick magnets. <laughs> if any fish has ick, it's the powder blue tang. But that doesn't kill them necessarily. I mean, yes, can it? Yes. But I had a powder blue tang for about five years. And just occasionally it would just be covered in ick. And then, you know, the next day it'd be completely healthy looking, you know, not a sign of it. It was the weirdest thing. And I just could look at her wrong and she'd get ick. It was so weird. But uh, she lived for a long time. Her final death was when I killed half the fish in my tank by being an idiot. And I turned off all the pumps on the tank that night to feed my sun corals, and I forgot I was feeding my sun corals, and I went to bed. And I woke up the next morning, and everything was off on the tank for seven, eight hours. And when I woke up, I saw the water level was this far down in the tank. There was no flow. There was fish littering the sand bed. I was devastated how stupid that was. And uh, I got all the pumps running, Spock survived it. She she was swimming. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong side. She was actually so oxygen deprived. She was slamming into corals like a bulldozer, and face down in the sand. You know, and I was holding her in front of uh, a Vortec pump, flowing fresh, moving water through her gills to revive her. I mean, it was that close to losing her. I lost some beautiful fish. I lost a flame angel, a powder blue, a copper band. You know, everything difficult to replace. I lost. Uh, clownfish lived through it. Uh, damsels lived through it, chromas lived through it, mandarin lived through it, uh, and the corals looked fantastic. It's like they don't even care about oxygen. They were all open and all their polyps were extended. It was crazy, but uh, that was so stupid. And so I made myself uh, a pact with, within myself that from now on, if I ever turn off a pump, it's either automated to turn on automatically or I set a timer to remind me to go turn that thing back on. But uh, that's a long story to, should you get a powder blue tang? If you can get one, yes. You should put it through quarantine. Uh, you should do everything you can to make sure it's disease free before you put it in your tank. But if you see a breakout on your body, you know, on their, on your body, on their body, you know, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. You might have to deal with it. You might be able to do like I did and just leave it be because it just came and went like cloud cover. You know, it was the weirdest thing. All right. Rosano says, hey, I like that, one name. You don't have a first and last name. Rosano says, Mark, is 1300 the best target for magnesium? My magnesium is 1215. Typical average uh, magnesium in any salt mix should be 1280. So 1300 is a good number. 
My own personal preference, I like 1400. Um, that seems to make my corals color up more, especially Montipora. So I really do like that number be higher. And uh, my tank actually, I've been looking at it over here. You can, it's blurry, but you can see that's all coralline on there. Normally I scrape that all off, but I've been kind of ignoring it. And I was thinking last night, maybe I'll just leave it on there and just let it completely coat the thing entirely in just pure purple. But at the same time, I really like that scraped off clean. I like the black wall right there. So we'll see what my mood says, but no, you want to raise it up. And if you can, you can uh, dose it. You can dose magnesium pronto. I sell that on my website and one jar is like 20 bucks, 20, 21, and it'll make up to five gallons of solution, which is a lot. And uh, that's what I use to dose my tank with magnesium. And I use a dosing pump. Um, you can use the Camor dosing pump and I have that on my website as well. The X1, which is a Bluetooth based dosing pump that works really well. Oh, speaking of fish, I wanted to talk about hippo. I want to talk about the hippo tang and the anemone cube because from time to time people bring that up and like, why haven't you moved that fish? That poor fish, you're so mean. I'm not mean, that fish is not unhappy. It doesn't have any stings on its body. It's getting well fed every single night. It has its own little hidey hole it sleeps in. And I was looking at her and she's about that size. And I was looking at the big clownfish in my tank that's about that size. She's slightly larger than the largest clownfish in my anemone cube. She will be moved and I'm going to do it when I break down that tank and replace it because I am going to get another tank to replace it. But uh, for now, I'm not going to try and catch her because she's so skittish and I know that she'll just dart into the rock work or go into her hidey hole inside the Montipora because that's where she sleeps and I won't catch her. She's not going to just hop into a net politely and say, yeah, move me into a bigger tank. She's not that kind of fish. So um, she's not that big. She's not, you know, horribly abused or anything remotely close to that. She, she loves to watch me when I'm working in the kitchen and uh, she doesn't look too big for the tank when you're looking at the tank. You know, the tank's 24 inches and she's like that. You know, it's just not a problem. If it was, I wouldn't leave it in there. But no, she seems happy there. Just please forward that email to me again and I will get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, I see you said you'll resend it. <clears throat> Bobby says, uh, I had low pH and I added buffer, my corals closed up. Why did this happen? Because buffer is alkalinity and you raise the alkalinity all of a sudden to try and get this magic pH number and your corals responded accordingly. So you want to not do that. Uh, Macy, I talked about the NDOC test uh, a little bit earlier and I'm going to be trying it out. I think it's down here on the floor. So this is the OES and this is the NDOC. So this one here is going to measure, uh, it says N, C, and P, which I would think is gonna be nitrogen and phosphate or phosphorus. Um, it also has NO3 slash N. It's got some kind of alkalinity reading and dissolved organic compounds, oops, right there. So these are some of the things that will be going into this kit that I send out next week. But do I have any more thoughts? No, but guess what? I filmed an interview with the guys in their booth. That's gonna be nice and long. <laughs> and hopefully you'll find that to be interesting. Matter of fact, I filmed a couple of really in-depth videos that are deep topics. So, uh, you know, if you're really new in the hobby and your eyes glaze over, it's not you. It's a really deep topic. But uh, I know there's a lot of different people on this channel. There's people that have been in the hobby a long time. There's people that have just joined the hobby yesterday. And with that diverse audience, I have to reach everyone. I don't want this to just be a newbie channel. I don't want this to just be a channel for experienced hobbyists. I want everyone to be included. And so in that regard, there is going to be a couple of these videos where it's gonna be like, wow, I had no idea. So my interview with Matt Peterson was a really, really deep one. Even as I was talking to him, I was like, wow, who's gonna actually watch this? <laughs> but it was about fish breeding and I found it to be very important to discuss. The city of, uh, Jess says, the city of Houston has been running a high ammonia level in the water. Will RODI filtering take care of that? Actually, it may not. If it's too high, the RODI filter can't remove it all. The two filters that remove it, remove it are the carbon block. So if you are measuring high levels of ammonia in your tap water, 
you might need to change out the carbon blocks more frequently, or you might have to treat the water after it's been made with uh, Seachem's Prime. Prime is a, is a product that you add to the water, it's completely reef safe, it locks up ammonia, chlorine, chloramine, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, it locks it all up. And you can actually put that in every single drop of new water you make if you want to keep yourself very safe. And I tell people whenever we're in drought season and you know they're doing all kinds of weird stuff to make the water potable for us, that's the perfect time to be using Prime automatically. So a cap full of Prime treats 50 gallons of water. So one bottle will go a very long way. It's inexpensive. It will make your water safe so you don't have to worry about affecting your livestock adversely. Ah, I see Tom was on here. I don't know the answer to that either, Plutza. Uh, you said that you've had your fish for three years and in two days you lost them all. Um, maybe it was a temperature thing. Tank got too hot and the oxygen levels dropped. Maybe there was a power outage while you were asleep for a long enough period that your fish died. Um, that's just a couple things. Could have been some kind of uh, pollutant got into the water. Rosano says, is it okay to let an ATO, an uh, automatic top off, reservoir sits stagnant for a month while it's being used or should I add a powerhead for circulation? No, it's fine. Uh, stored RODI water can be saved for up to a month. If it's longer, you might toss it and just make, make an, a new batch. My uh, container down here, this container holds 45 gallons. I refill it every week. When I went to Macna, it was up here. And when I came back from the trip, it was down to here. There's no circulation in there whatsoever. This just constantly is, is being topped off to the sump as needed. And then I refill this once a week. But it's just the, the pump to push water out. That's it. That's the only thing in there. So it stays nice and pure. I try to never open it if I don't have to. I made myself a big access door to feed the pump in and to install a float valve. You know, I first set it up. But if I can keep my hand out of there for three years, that's a good thing. But no, you don't have to circulate RODI water. I was just in a conversation with someone on Facebook about this because he actually puts an air stone in his RODI water to aerate it. And I told him that's actually not a good idea because your air pump is going to suck air from the room and push it into the water. And RODI water is deionized water. It is ion free. It is screaming for any ions it can get. If you put your hand in the water, if you uh, leave the lid off for a while, the TDS will just rise basically osmotically. Well, if you're pumping in air from the room, and we know the air we breathe is not clean, you're pumping all that crap into your water, you're actually bubbling it up with a bunch of TDS, and you'll measure it a while later, and you'll see the number has risen. So you don't aerate your RODI water, you don't circulate it, um, but if it gets too old, just toss it and make a new batch. Of course, Yagi has the perfect powder blue tank that's never had a spot on its body in two years. That's awesome, that's great. Macy says, I'm going to be away from my tank for two weeks. Should I take the socks and floss out or leave it? It fills up every four days. I would remove them because odds are you're not going to have anyone's going to be willing to do that for you because that's not their hobby. It's your hobby. So I'll just remove the socks. Um, you don't have to worry about your tank being noisy. You don't have to worry about how it looks while you're gone. Um, so if you have to have a big barrel of top off water in front of your tank, because normally you wouldn't because you like to have room to walk around your tank. But while you're gone, you can put a big trash can of water in front and have plenty of top off water. Uh, you want to make sure that your skimmer isn't overflowing uh, you know, while you're gone. You know, so I, I don't know if you're going to have a tank sitter or you're going to use a, a webcam to watch it. But uh, yeah, no, I would remove the socks. I would remove anything that needs rigly, uh, rigorous maintenance while you're away. Chris says, the best way I've found to get rid of my invading Aptasia is the cute peppermint shrimp. That's the only ones you should buy. Don't buy the ugly ones. Only get the cute ones. And I totally agree. They're awesome. Is it safe to put a bristle tooth tang in a 70-gallon aquarium, considering it's some of the, one of the smallest tangs uh, out there? Yeah, that would be a good one. And I would try to get a young one, a little one, so you can enjoy it as it's a juvenile. And as it gets larger, you know, maybe at some point you'll be upgrading and you can move that fish to the larger tank. My, in my tank, there's mine right there. And uh, she's 
much smaller. She's probably half the size of Spock, and uh, she's very active. She's a she's a cleaner, so I'm trying to make sure she's nice and fat. So I'm putting in nori every single day, specifically for her. Cordero says, "What do you think about the Jabo doser?" I don't have an opinion. I've not used one. I've not even looked at one. Sorry. Um. Glenn says, while you're at Macna, was there any super expensive rare corals or fish that you really liked? I didn't look at the prices. I, matter of fact, I pretty much just barely glanced at the corals because I am, I'm an equipment junkie <laughs> and I have a tank full of corals, so I'm not looking for more. And you know, it's, I just kind of like, mm, okay, rather than like looking for that perfect acro or that perfect zoanthid or that perfect, I'm just not doing that. I did go by the biota booth because they are tank raising fish from eggs, from embryos, and they had mandarins this big which i just love i love these little tiny psychedelic mandarins they are being raised on aquarium food uh, poma labs was there and i never saw their booth in three days i totally missed it which annoys me because they are growing some gorgeous expensive fish the uh pomacanthus angel that becomes this big which is a corallivore which means it eats corals they were showing those at macna last year or two years ago and they were five thousand dollars each that's pretty expensive, but uh, I didn't see their booth this year. It makes me really mad. I just, like I said, there wasn't enough time this, this year. But uh, <clears throat> I heard there was one vendor there that had two blue ring octopus in the same tank together, which caused a lot of people to be upset. And they even reported that booth to the, uh, the people that ran the show because it was inappropriate behavior. And as from what I heard, is by putting both of them in the same tank together, they ended up fighting to the death and one died. So that was bad. Plus, you know, they weren't there to educate people about it. I think they just wanted to have this really cool creature in their tank just to get people to come over to their booth to talk to them about whatever they were selling or, or talking about. But it wasn't about octopus education. They didn't have tanks designed to keep an octopus inside. And they just kind of, from what I heard, third hand, was that they kind of acted like this creature was disposable. You know, it just didn't matter. It was like they just needed it for a couple of days. And that's a horrible attitude. And uh, Macna, of course, is going to make sure that doesn't happen again. It's actually in the contract that everything has to be ethically treated and, and properly cared for and protected. And I was talking with uh, one vendor, and he was saying, you know, when you look at all those tanks set up at Macna, he said, if you really look closely, they don't have any kind of fail safes installed on those tanks like we do with ours you know we have battery backups we have a generator you know we, we're prepared for it we have monitors to send us a text or, or an email instantly if there's a problem those tanks are in a big convention center on shared electrical lines that go to multiple booths and if some guy has like a huge heater plugged in he could literally literally trip the breaker and wipe out six booths overnight and no one knows because no one's getting a notification that there's a power outage, for example. I mean, I, I never even thought about that, and that totally makes sense. So I'm wondering if everyone's gonna have a mind stream on their tanks one day, or everyone's gonna have an apex on their tank at the show, which I know it's more stuff to bring in and hook up, but at the same time, knowing your livestock temperature is okay in the middle of the night, you know, you're coming back from the bar, my tank is 68 degrees, I gotta get back in there, you know? I mean, it'd be nice to know, rather than finding out the next day when you walk in, your tank is cloudy because a heater exploded or some bad thing happened. So that was an interesting conversation that I uh, had never even given any thought to. But no, that was about it. I didn't really see anything else. I mean, like I said, I wasn't looking for livestock, so I wasn't, uh, that stuff didn't catch my eye. Brian says, what would, what's the worst that would happen if my skimmer was overflowing during an extended vacation that I'm on? I'm watching it via camera and I have no way to empty it when it's full. Well, the worst is, is that all the waste it's pulled out is going to go back in the system. The other part is that when a skimmer overflows, it tends to spatter moisture into your stand all over the top of the sump, on top of everything you own, and it could even spatter on some electrical stuff, depending on where the outlets are located. So that is kind of a drawback. 
I would highly recommend everyone have a waste collector on their skimmer. And a, all you need is a tube coming out of the collection cup that goes into something. A jug, a bucket, a pretty acrylic something. Uh, there's a lot of companies that make them. Avast Marine sells the, I think they call it Davy Jones Locker. Coral View has one where you get a bucket and this whole electric gizmo that goes with it that when the bucket is full, it will stop the power to the skimmer. And then like I showed you guys before, I bought this thing for 60 bucks that will turn off the skimmer when the collection cup is full. So I would, I would recommend something like this, especially if you're traveling. So your skimmer won't be on the entire time you're gone, but at least it's not overflowing and making a mess, which I think is much better than having to come home and have foam everywhere and a big mess. Now, if your skim is overflowing straight into a floor drain, that's a whole other situation because now your tank is going to be topping off more water because it's losing water constantly, and that's, that's going to be a disaster. So you may need to send someone to your home, you know, whether it's a tank sitter or call a fish store or call a neighbor and say, I need you to do such and such for me and see if they'll do it. Uh, those are some of the things that come to mind. Uh, Brian, if you uh, do turn it off with your Apex, awesome. Uh, your pH will not fall. Your protein skimmer is not making pH rise and fall. It's actually, okay, so that was one of the things I was wanting to test with the Mindstream. I wanted to measure my O2 level on my tank for a few days, and then I wanted to turn off my protein skimmer for a couple of days and see if the O2 level drops in the tank. Because you always hear, having the skimmer on adds air. Well, I have no proof of that. Maybe I can prove it with a Mindstream. Maybe I can't. I don't know. So I want to test that theory. That was one of my ideas. See, you pried it out of me. Do you, uh, Cordero says, do you have a copper band butterfly or a bicolor angel? If so, do you think about, if so, what do you think about them and are they reef safe? The copper band butterfly is definitely reef safe. And there's even a different type of copper band. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's in that family, it's a butterfly, but it's not quite the copper band. It has different markings and that one's even more uh, desired they are, that's a good fish to uh, eat Aptasia, maybe eat Mahano. Uh, it'll eat worms, it'll eat whatever it can find that fits its little tiny mouth. It can nip at certain corals. It might, you know, kind of look at the tentacles off of a bubble coral or off of a blasto and maybe nip at it. But no, they're, they're pretty much reef safe. But the problem is butterflies are so hard to keep alive. And I'm lucky I have one that's doing well. I've had her now for probably three years. And, uh, but I've, there was many that didn't make it. I bought it, I fed it, and it just died. And I felt like maybe it was captured with cyanide because it died for no reason. You know, it wasn't like something in my tank caused it. And, uh, you know, so I, that's my default excuse. Oh, cyanide, you know, because <laughs> we don't know how the fish are being caught. We don't know if they're being caught with a net or if there's an unscrupulous diver out there that used cyanide to stun the fish, which actually kills their internal organs and they still swim around, they look normal, they eat, and then they just drop dead. And that happens with flame angels, that happens with copper bands, it's really frustrating. And so for a while there, I stopped buying copper bands entirely because I felt like I was just adding to the problem. You know, they're not disposable, and if they take one out of the ocean for me and I put it in my tank and it drops dead, and I go buy another one and put it in my tank and it drops dead, and I just keep doing that, I'm actually adding to the problem what's going on with our oceans. So I was very uh, adamant not to get one. And then I was in a fish store and they had one for sale and they showed me it eating and I took a chance after a long, I mean, after many years and I finally decided, let me get one. And that one didn't survive either. It died within a week. And I was like, see, I knew it. And when I called the store and explained to them what had happened, they actually told me to come get another, which I didn't do for a year. But a year later I was in their store and they handed me the, the replacement copper band who's in my tank to this day. And she's doing really well. She's probably on the back side right now. She likes it on the back of the reef more than the front. And uh, the bicolor angel, I've never kept, so I can't answer that one. Brian, all I can tell you about pH is don't worry about pH. And just let pH do whatever it does. Worry about alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, temperature, salinity. Get all those right, pH will be whatever it is. Yes. The, uh, that's the butterfly fish I was talking about. Uh, that is the nicer 
of the copper bands. And it's beautiful. I think it comes from Australia. So I put that on the screen for you guys. Uh, I thought it, the name was slightly different. Is it margined butterfly fish? I thought it was something slightly close to that, but not quite that. But anyway, uh, that was, I do like the look of that fish. I've never got one, but I think they're really pretty. All right, guys, we've been at this for, oh, too long. We went longer than I expected. I only want to go an hour and a half. We're at 144. Today is water test Saturday. Please do test your water. Don't just turn off the stream and not test. Test your water. I'm going to go test mine. I've got test kits and I got the Trident and I got the mine stream so I can compare everything. And I do want to know where my numbers are. You know, I was gone for a week. I need to make sure everything's okay on the tank. Uh, I do want to mention, so did anything bad happen on my tank while I was gone? Yes. Something super annoying happened with my calcium reactor, which just bugs the heck out of me because it's completely my fault. I have a CO2 tank that had been hooked up for many months. And ever since I had the Trident control the calcium reactor, the CO2 has lasted much longer, which is awesome. However, as I was getting close to time to leave for Macna, I said I really need to refill that, just top off that tank so it's full, so there's nothing, you know, no problems when I'm gone. But then I had all these problems on my back. I told you guys about it. I was unhappy, I was miserable, and I was hurting, and I was seeing doctors and doing MRIs and all that kind of stuff, which took much longer than I planned. And then Monday night, oh, I'd say about two in the morning, three hours before my flight, I look at the CO2 tank and the gauge did this. I was like, of course, you're empty. And the fish, I mean, the uh, liquor store's closed in the middle of the night. I couldn't just quickly run up and get a tank full of gas because I forgot, it was my fault. So I told my tank sitter, I need you to take the tank off. I need you to you know, go to the liquor store, fill it up, reinstall it, you know, get it going. And he uh, wasn't, he said he'd do it, but he wasn't gonna do it like immediately. And then he said, there's still some gas left. And I was like, just change it. And I could watch the Trident saying my alkaline was dropping. And I was like, oh. I said, I need you to change that tank. He goes, but there's still some gas. Like, I don't care. Fill it up. The gauges are lying to you. And then he says, your gauges are bad. I'm like, I don't care. Change the gas. So he did. He changed the tank out. But in that, my, and my alkaline didn't drop a lot. But it's been so stable at 9.3 that when it, my tank went down to 8.2, which is only a change of 1 dKH, I had a little speck of an acropora right there next to that chalice. It was this big. I mean, it was the size of my pinky nail. And it was the last remaining bit of life from my unknown acro. I lost the acro, but I had that puddle growing. I was like, okay, I can work from that. Well, I came back and that is a bone white, stone dead acropora now. I was like, ugh. And I lost a little bit of life inside my Dreamcatcher acro, which is that one right there. But uh, everything else in the tank did fine. So, I mean, I'm complaining about a 10th of 1% of my reef that took a slight hit while I was gone for seven days. But uh, I actually have a second CO2 tank that was empty. I was gonna get them both filled at the same time and I just never got around to it. And you know, I told the tank sitter, I'm not mad at you, I'm mad at myself that I didn't do it before I left town because I meant to do it, it just didn't get done. And now I'm asking you to do all this extra stuff for me and I feel bad. But uh, thank God he was able to change it out while I was gone and kind of at least keep it from getting any lower. Matter of fact, uh, he also noticed something else, and he found other things that we worked on too. But it's great to have someone that can keep an eye on your tank that knows tanks. And so that, that part's really good. Um, so yeah, test your water, make sure all your equipment's working right, keep everything nice and clean, and post your results. You know, come to Club Mealer's Reef and show us your parameters today. I'd love to see them. Um, and if you have questions or you just want to share a video of your tank or you want to show pictures of something, we'd love to see them. That's, that's why we're here. And uh, there will be another live stream next Saturday at 2 p.m. Thanks, guys. Bye.